All right, first we're going to look at test-driven design definitions and justifications and some observations about test-driven design and development in particular. Uh, then we're going to talk about refactoring, which is a core discipline of test-driven uh, design and a practice that really all good developers should embrace when they're writing code, no matter what uh, uh, methodologies they're working on. Then we're going to look at how to manage the writing of unit tests and some good ideas about how to deal with that. And uh, we're going to look at Visual Studio itself um, and how it natively implements unit testing. And we're going to talk a little bit about a couple of alternatives to the internal unit testing capability that Visual Studio has that work pretty well. <clears throat> in the uh, call to action at the end, we're, we'll review some things that you'll need to consider when you're actually implementing uh, test-driven design and how to make it work for you. And then we'll go ahead and uh, end with our Q&A session. All right, so what's all this about, this test-driven design stuff? The traditional development uh, has a, a couple of uh, well-known issues um, that developers and designers and architects have to deal with and project managers, of course. Um, how many times have you heard the complaints that are up on your screen right now? You hear them during the initial stages, and you hear them a lot after the project goes past its deadline and you find the code doesn't work. And you have to go back to the, the uh, management team and say, uh, we need more money, we need more time. If you look into these things and point by point, you can see the requirements are really never fully baked. But that is uh, really to be expected, and you can deal with that through proper development planning. Um, you see the design time isn't nearly enough. If you're doing monolithic waterfall SDLC and you require the whole design complete up front uh, and require minute details, yeah, you're going to run into this. The design time wasn't enough. But if you redefine what design means and what's delivered, maybe not. And many times the design time isn't factored into project plan, which is, a, which is an issue. Now, artificial deadlines can force devs just to make it work. And yes, it's a pain, and there's technical debt that can break the bank if this isn't addressed properly. If you've ever read the book Death March, you'd probably remember this is one of the primary anti-patterns associated with a Death March project, um, the fact that there's an artificial deadline and it's hard to meet. And it wasn't put in there for any real business or technical reason. Now, last issue, is, you'll hear this complaint um, from anyone outside of QA, the QA is full of slackers, and this usually isn't the case. They're doing their jobs, and they're keeping buggy bad code out of production, and if they're, they're conflicting with your schedule, you need to find ways of writing the code better so that it can get through testing. If you, if you really got through the code, and, uh, and they got it, and it worked, they'd really love it. They wouldn't have to deal with this. Now, Test last is a typical way most projects devolve into incorporating. Even when everyone on team says they've got to do better next time, unit testing is the second thing cut, uh, really next to documentation, when pressure to complete by a hard date actually builds. I see this countless times when task plans or project plans actually do manage to call it out, unit testing is secondary. You've probably seen coding and testing as a task. And most developers will be more interested in writing the application code then code to actually test it, and most project managers prefer coding to get things done faster so they can meet their milestones in better time. So developer level unit testing usually falls to the wayside or doesn't even get done. Uh, it's just given lip service in the project plan. Now because the tools themselves have become more sophisticated, compilers can catch uh, syntax issues, code analysis produces maintainability indexes, and, uh, and measures of code smell, things like that. Some developers feel that their code doesn't actually need further testing. <laughs> then you get the prima donna developers that figure their code's always right the first time out of the box, right? This just isn't the case. If I have a function that adds 2 and 8, and all the tools say it's fine, but when I run the answer and get 11, it's my own fault I didn't unit test. I didn't check for expected results. If the developers don't buy into the value prop, no, they can skimp on properly writing tests and we're broken right from the start. If the project manager or the team lead or developers don't write an invalid prop uh, in general, the developers won't test until something gets reported as broken by the test group. Reactive testing is really a lot more costly than upfront testing. If you have to go all the way down the line and then come back, uh, you're, you're adding incremental cost and time and, uh, and uh, man, man hours. The developers are really just supposed to churn out code and the quality is secondary. They figure testing is owned by the test team and it happens during the test phase. That's a big issue. If they perceive their job as just to push out that code um, and not push out quality, you're going to have problems. And you really do end up paying for it in the end, many times more than if you've done testing early on. The why should be obvious. You have to repeat the cycle over again, for one thing, and you have to involve all the additional all players all over again. 
and then debugging, which usually takes longer than writing, tests would uh, have to come into play. You have to find where the error happened as opposed to immediately seeing that an error was incurred when you made a change. Now, test-driven development itself has origins in extreme programming, um, and part of the agile development process that's uh, exemplified in extreme programming, XT, uh, does have to do with uh, adding TDD to it. Um, it can be implemented with other agile methods. It's not really a methodology in itself for uh, the entire software development lifecycle. It's specifically for doing the design and development. You can add it to RUP, you can add it to Agile UP, you can add it to Scrum, uh, XP, and everything else. Developers have to demonstrate an understanding of success and failure conditions before they code. That's very important. They have to know what they're testing and what they're expecting to come back when they actually um, write their tests. Uh, this, this is actually more difficult to find than you might think. Some developers really don't know this. Uh, they don't know that they should be testing inside bounds, outside bounds. They should be testing for exceptions. They just figure, well, I'll pass it what's proper, and I'll just make sure it's coming back. And if you know what, what uh, should be passed to a method and what results should happen, you can write the test. And this is a, a primary point and a primary part of being able to, to perform TDD is that you're actually changing your perception on how this should work. When a developer first looks at how they're going to write a function or uh, how they're going to call a function, He'll look at the interface first, and then he's going to implement it second. This helps him design code that's easily callable. Furthermore, since the developer also has to consider that code is testable, he'll have to write it so it's not tightly dependent on other functions, or even on the operating environment. You'll have to ensure that the function being written is decoupled from other code and can run without requiring that other functions be written. And we'll get into some ways developers can do this later on, but the important fact is that you're really testing one single piece. Uh, you've got the um, system under test, the SUT that you're going to look at, and that's the thing you want to test. You don't want to test 15 other functions along with it because one of those might be the point of failure. So, again, it is a change in the point of view. Went too far in that one, sorry. That's some of the advantages of TDD. Um, coming from developers, and you can see the reference down the bottom of the screen. I took this from an article that was very interesting, uh, where they actually checked with some developers. And some of the high on the list were things about quick results. The developers, when they're actually making changes to their tests, affect changes to their code. And when they affect the change in the code, they can immediately see uh, what the effects are, meaning they can run the code, they can write the code, they can run the test, they can see something broke, and they can fix it right away. It's very flexible because unlike typical um, testing uh, without TDD, you're writing the tests <coughs> um, and writing the changes to your code very iteratively. They're both happening at the same time. You write a test, you write code. You write test, you write code. So you're not waiting to write your entire set of code and then writing your test, um, trying to hope or hopefully trying to catch every single piece that uh, you might have missed. You have an old line of catalog regression test. You're building tests. You're, you're building them all along. You've got this, this suite of tests being built. You come back to this application in six months and have to add things to it. You, you know immediately. You run your unit test after you make the change. You can find out what broke. So you're not building additional tests. You've already got it there. It's really good. Uh, it also produces good, clean code that works. Uh, JUnit was really about the first um, unit testing main, um, framework that was in use for Java. And the mantra was basically, if the light is green, the code is clean. Um, in TDD, you're looking at red, you're looking at green, and then you're looking at um, refactoring. And I'll get into that later. Now, 